can see from the screen, our scripture reading this morning is found in the 25th chapter of Genesis. We're going to read from the 21st verse. Before we do that, how many of you enjoyed the young people this morning? Can I see your hands? You want to say, how many want to say thank you? All right. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but Carrie Alexander was playing at the piano accompanying them, and I can testify that Donna spent a lot of hours practicing to get them to be able to do that. So we are blessed, aren't we, to have those young people. We're just blessed to be in a church. Genesis 25, verses 21 through 23. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. I'm looking forward to the message this morning following that text. I have a little <clears throat> trivia quiz for you this morning. Two or three questions. Um, do you remember how old Abraham was when Isaac was born? Okay, several said, several said 100 years old. And you are right. Okay, 100 years old. Well, let's see. Uh, do you remember how old Abraham was when Isaac got married? That's not as quite as easy, is it? Uh, he was 140 years old. Isaac was 40, and so Dad was 140 years old. Do you remember how old Abraham was when the twins, Jacob and Esau, were born? That one may be a tough one, too. All right, so someone says 160. He was 160 years old, according to Scripture. 160 years old whenever the two grandsons were born. Well, how old was he when he died? All right. Okay. All right. Uh, that was a quick answer. He was 175, Sarah says. So <clears throat> just a little arithmetic then. How long did he have, did he live to enjoy his two grandsons, Esau and Jacob? 15 years. And I have a feeling that Grandpa Abraham made the most of those 15 years, don't you think? He was one interested grandpa. Why? Well, I think it's obvious. Grandpa, grandfathers are interested in their grandchildren. Amen? That was pretty weak. Amen. And I think that was only from a grandmother. We grandpas, I have five, and I am interested in the rearing and the raising and the development of my grandchildren. Um, and so was Grandpa Abraham, for other obvious reasons, because of God's promise to him and so on, right? Now, <clears throat> um, whenever they are around the campfire outside the tents at night, 
Uh, did Grandpa have quite a few children's stories to tell his grandsons? Yeah, he did. He could tell them about the time when God called him when he was 75 and says, Abram, pack your bags, get your wife and all your stuff, and leave. And I'll tell you where to go. Oh, he could tell them all kinds of stuff about going, having to go to Egypt and stuff. He could tell them about Sodom and Gomorrah. He could tell them about how when God came down to him personally and made a covenant with him. And he had to, he had to bring all these sacrifices and do these things. Probably, probably their favorite story. What do you think it was? Come on now. The almost sacrifice of Isaac. Because that one included not only grandpa, but it included dad too. And um, they were excited about that. And man, I can imagine that they were all eyes and ears whenever it got to the point where grandpa was raising the knife and just about to stab his own son. And an angel said, don't do it. And guess what? There was a ram caught in a thicket over there. Well, um, so as time passes, and uh, Jacob says, Papa, tell us again about when you almost sacrificed Dad. And, they, and Esau goes, Oh, do we have to hear that again? Because you see, the Bible says and tells us some things that took place. And Grandpa Abraham began to see right away the divergent paths of these, his two grandsons. Yeah? Yes. Um, and then, lo and behold, um, uh, <clears throat> It says here that uh, whenever, after Isaac pleaded for his wife, Rebecca, there, and um, the children struggled, even in the womb they were fighting. <laughs> Why am I like this? And God said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated. One shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. How was it back in those days about someone serving someone else? Who served who? The younger served the older, right? I mean, that's how we do it traditionally back in Abraham's day. By the way, um, just because we do some things traditionally in our church doesn't necessarily mean, I better be careful, that it's sacred or holy. It may just mean that it's tradition. <laughs> and that's all. Well, anyway, I don't want to get myself into too much trouble here. So, um, what do you think? Did Isaac ever talk to Dad about the angel's pronouncement? What do you think? Did Isaac ever go to his father Abraham and say, Dad, you know, you, did you hear what the angel told my wife? The older would serve the younger. And I can imagine because Abraham is old now and he's had much experience with his God, I can hear him saying, Isaac, just let Yahweh lead Watch for his providence. Well, uh, here in chapter 25, if you want to follow me in your Bible, <clears throat> here in chapter 25, a family drama quickly appears. Notice verse 24. Genesis 25 and verse 24. So when the days were fulfilled for her to give birth, sure enough, just like the angel said, there were twins. 
And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment. <clears throat> and so they named him Esau. And his nickname was Red. Whenever I was in school, I had a friend, and his nickname was Red. He had red hair and freckles, and they called him Red, affectionately. Um, well, then, um, after he was born, out came uh, his brother with his hand uh, on his brother's heel. And um, so they named him Heel Grabber. Jacob, Jacob, Harry and Heel Grabber, if you please. Um, and Isaac was 60 years old, and it says, so the boys grew, verse 27. Notice carefully, we don't read Scripture carefully enough, and we don't ponder it and meditate on it and give it enough time so the Holy Spirit can sink its principles and its lessons into our heads and into our hearts. I find that for myself, at least. And I find, Pastor Dan, that whenever I have to go to Scripture and prepare sermons, I am most blessed of everybody and uh, because I have to look and study and pray and um, stuff. So it is. Well, anyway, the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Jacob was just the opposite. He was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And notice what happens here. Listen up, moms and dads. Listen up, grandpas and grandmas. Isaac loved Esau. Because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Potential problems right on the horizon? Yes. Listen, moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas. You have children, you love them just the same. I don't care if that one is a rounder and if that one loves Jesus. You love them just the same. Yes? And it could be. Here's, the, here's, here's what makes parenting and in, listen, grandparents. You have not been called by God to spoil your grandchildren. As much as you may think it. I don't find it biblical anywhere. Sir, it says, spoil your grandchildren. Did I hear an amen? From a, you're not a grandma. You can't be. But at least you agree. Okay? You are called to... Listen, I had a brother. I have a brother. Who had a serious rift with my mama and daddy. Because they were disciplining their granddaughter. His daughter. And it caused a significant rift. And I, you know, I was blown away. I said, what are you doing? You know, it used to be that the community raised the children along with the parents and the grandparents, right? It used to be that he, the church helped a lot in raising the, grandparents, uh, in raising the children. But now we've got, such, and we've got into such a situation where, you know, hey, why are you, why are you talking to my kid like that? Well, the reason is probably because your kid needed to be talked like that. Yes? Yeah. So anyway, uh, lots of lessons learned here. Um, so we have this, listen. God has insight into your character. And He has foresight into what you will become. Amen? Amen? He had insight into the characters of these two grandchildren, and he had foresight to know what they would become. And by the way, each of them, each one of them had a choice into what they would become. Uh, so here we have these two guys, and uh, well, it says here that Esau was a skillful hunter. 
Uh, I picture Esau as a kind of a guy, a don't fence me in kind of a guy. Just let, you know, the song says, just must let me loose and let me wander and do my thing and uh, let me take my bow and arrow and stuff. And uh, I love, I love the excitement of the chase and the thrill of the kill. Throw in some feasting and, and so and stuff like that and I'm happy. And he wasn't too interested in spiritual matters, was he? He was not. You ever heard of two brothers who had the same spiritual input? One went this way and one went that way? It's happened a number of times in Scripture, hasn't it? It happens, it happens all the time. So there again, moms and dads, don't beat yourself up too much if one goes this way and one goes the other way. God had the same problem too. So did Adam and Eve. So did Abraham and... Uh, Sarah, so did Isaac and Rebekah. Okay? Um, so he, he saw us here, and um, he just likes those kinds of things. Well, Isaac, it says here, was a, I'm sorry, uh, verse 27 again, Jacob was a mild man, and it's interesting that in the, um, um, evidently he was kind of different, he was quiet, peace-loving, he was a shepherd, um, and so on, um, but um, that word mild means settled, and in my center margin it says complete. Jacob was a complete man, and the Hebrew word suggests an amiable, pious, and cultured personality. He was stable, and his mother liked that about him, and so she tended to favor him. Uh, and so Esau was glad for Jake to do all the stuff around the camp and whatever, because he could be, he would want to be out and not be, you know, saddled with the mundane chores of life, if you please. Um, uh, Isaac loved Esau because he was, you know, he was there at home and he, I, Esau would come in from the field and telling dad of all of his hunting trips and so dad got excited and he sure loved, man, his son could cook too, man, he loved that stuff and all those spices and all those seasonings that he put in that venison was just, whoo, it was really good. Um, but Esau... He didn't like um, spiritual matters. Um, did Isaac ever talk to the boys about their future? About what God had for them? What do you think? Sure he did. I mean, if, if he and Rebecca, that was their, you know, I mean, you know, they were caught up with all of that. These two, their sons, God had made a promise here and so on. Uh, um, it's interesting that the privileges for the firstborn were successful uh, succession to the official authority of the father, the inheritance of a double portion of the father's uh, property and wealth. Now Esau would have liked that, wouldn't he? Yes. The privilege of becoming the family priest. Nah, but nah. Esau didn't want to have any part of that. No, no, no. Uh, that stuff is just now. Um, and to their descendants, um, in Abraham's case, succession to uh, the earthly Canaan that God had promised, and they were to be the progenitors of the Messiah. And all of that part of it, Jacob really picked up on, and that was his great desire. And he knew about the angel's pronouncement that the older would serve the younger, and that made him excited, don't you think? Yes, because he was there, and that was where his head was at. The um, Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, you don't have to turn there, but it says, it describes Esau as a profane person. And that word profane means he was irreligious. He was godless. I know something about godless. 
I am the youngest of four brothers. My oldest brother at 54 was driving home from work one day and he reached up here and was scratching his neck and he felt a little a bump and a knot inside there and uh, decided he better go to the doctor. Went to the physician. I found out it was melanoma. And so for the next four or five years, my brother fought melanoma cancer, went out to the John Wayne uh, Cancer City in Los Angeles and had three or four or half, I don't know, a bunch of surgeries. And finally, um, uh, the last time he went, they said, Stanley, I'm sorry, we can't do anything for you. The cancer has just gone too far. And so get your house together. Um, my brother Stanley, my oldest brother, was a profane person. He was irreligious. Now, that doesn't mean that he was a bad person. In fact, he was a very good guy. In fact, whenever he had to retire because of the cancer, he was the he was the uh, <clears throat> uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico. He had to retire because of the cancer. And um, he had no desire for anything spiritual. Yet he was as good as guys you'd ever want to meet. So it doesn't mean that Esau was necessarily a bad person. It just means that he had no desire or, or inclination or de, uh, for spiritual matters. And so my brother Stanley asked me, if I would preach his funeral. And I said, yes, Stanley, I will. That would be my high privilege to do that. He said, Rex, I don't want you to preach any religious sermon. I don't want you to preach any evangelistic sermon about me or on my behalf or anything like that. Just And so I said, okay, Stanley, whatever you want. Um, he said, well, what are you going to say? <laughs> I said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about chickens and pigs and turkeys and parakeets and stuff like that. Because he was, whenever we were kids, he was quite an entrepreneur. Uh, he, uh, a truck would pull up to our house. We lived 20 miles out uh, to, uh, from the nearest town. And uh, we were out in the country. And a uh, truck would pull up. And here was a box about yay by yay. 30 by 30 or so, about this tall. Cheap, 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 cheap. Open up and here's, here's about a hundred little, little downy golden chicks. And he would raise them. And then the next year it would be pigs. And then two years later it would be parakeets. He had one big cage, two big cages full of parakeets. And one day the little brat, that was me, let them out of the cage. It was, it was unintentional. But here you saw out of the wheat field, you see blue and gold and orange and red parakeets flying out over the field. It was a beautiful sight, but it wasn't too pretty at the time. <laughs> so, um, um, we don't have... Strictly from a human standpoint, we don't have too much hope for our brother's eternal life. And so that's a burden that we bear. But anyway, being that as it may, uh, here it says that <clears throat> he was that way. And um, um, so uh, what do you think about, uh, I need to move along here quickly. <clears throat> what do you think about Rebecca and Isaac? Did they talk much about what the angel had said, the proclamation of the angel? What do you think? Maybe a better question would be, how many times do you think that they talked the matter over as they laid in bed at night? Many a time, no doubt. But evidently, both of them were clear, still set in their... They were unshaken, both mom and dad, listen up, both mom and dad were unshaken in their determination as to what should take place. Here is 
This is God's family. Yes? There is, I mean, all people, all families are God's families, but this is the family that God is bestowing us His special blessing on and through whom He's going to, through His descendants and through Messiah, He's going to accomplish His purpose in this planet. Right? And here they are. And <clears throat> Isaac is determined to have it one way. And Rebekah is determined to have it another way. And Jacob is totally caught up in the spiritual aspect of all of that is involved. And Esau is totally disinterested. And if you please, we have God's family. God is bestowing His special blessings on this family, and they are a totally dysfunctional family. So cheer up, ladies and gentlemen. I hate these things. You may be dysfunctional, and your family may be dysfunctional, but God works with dysfunctional families. Praise His name. Hello? Yes. And he ultimately fixes us. If we will hang in there like he hangs in there with us. Praise his name. Well, so here's the deal. We are never to get set in our ways. Let me repeat that. We are never to get set in our ways, but we are always to get set in God's ways. And, uh, and, and getting set in God's ways means that we will always be changing in our ways. We will be coming less and less like ourselves, hello, praise God, and much more, more like Jesus. Much more like Jesus. And... Um, and that speaks of the critical value of the devotional life. Whenever I place myself, whenever I sit down in the morning or whenever it is, and I carve out the time, and I take time to open my Bible and meditatively and prayerfully meditate on its words and, I, and apply them to my life, then the Holy Spirit has the opportunity and the opportunities on a consistent basis to change me from how I am to how Jesus is. Amen? And so it is. And so uh, obeying God becomes natural for the Christian. Why? Because we have new hearts and new lives. i got to move on quickly. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, by the way, how old were these two twins, Jacob and Esau, when all of this took place? Well, let's see. It says in chapter 24, um, no, I'm sorry. Let's go over to uh, chapter 26 and verse 34, quickly. It says that Esau was 40 years old, and he took wives and so on. Then, as you get into chapter 27, it came to pass when Isaac was old, and if you look at all the references in Scripture, Isaac was 137, and it's interesting that uh, his half-brother Ishmael died at 137. That's what the Bible says. And now, and he was 14 years older than, than Isaac. And so now when Isaac gets 137, he's thinking, you know what? I may, uh, I may uh, meet my maker here pretty soon. And so notice what Isaac does. Uh, so, <clears throat> how old were they? The Bible says that when Jacob finally got to Egypt, remember? with all the family, after the whole thing with Joseph and his brothers, that he, uh, he told Pharaoh, I'm 130 years old. At that time, Joseph was 39. Joseph was 30 when he first stood before Pharaoh. Do you remember? You remember the story. And 
uh, whenever dad, dad, he said, he said, listen, dad, we've had seven years of plenty, and this is, we, and we've had two years of famine, so that means that at that time, Joseph was 39. 130 minus 39 would make Jacob, would make uh, uh, Jacob 91 whenever Joseph, whenever, let me get my name straight here, whenever the twins were born. That was 20 years after he had fled from his brother Esau. That's what we're talking about. 91, no, I'm sorry, that was 14 years after he had fled from his brother. 91 minus 14 is 77. Jacob and Esau were 77 years old whenever this drama takes place in regards to the, the stealing of the blessing. They weren't just kids, 20 years old or, or whatever, trying to find themselves. They were grown men and had been grown men for a long time. And here is God's family, listen up. Here is God's family trying to accomplish God's will in their own way, and they thoroughly messed it up in every respect. And so, brothers and sisters, as a result, we have been robbed. We. And the whole world since then, we have been robbed to see how God would have worked it out in His own way, according to His own wisdom and according to His own will, if the family had just cooperated with Him instead of wanting to do it their own way. You know what? We're still doing it. I don't care if you're talking about, dare I even say it? Dare I let it escape from my lips? I don't care if you're talking about women's ordination. Down to whatever is happening in the family. The reason why is because we are trying to accomplish God's will our own way too many times. And if our church, brothers and sisters, listen to me, from the general conference president on down to the least of us, if our church ever needed unity, we need it today. Because our country is unraveling at a rapid rate. And our world is unraveling at a rapid rate. And we've got to... S Don't misunderstand me. We must not get divided. We must not allow current political situations to divide us as a people. You read the life of Christ. You read the life of Paul... And they never got caught up. That doesn't mean that they weren't loyal citizens and all that sort. And, and if, they, if they voted back there for the emperor, which I don't think they did, they probably would have voted. But the point is this. We have a bigger mission than to worry about who's going to get into this position or that position or that position. We have to worry about a whole world. God has a bigger mission for us, and that is to fix the, fix the situation to do His will in His way. Well, quickly, I've run out of time, but if you give me... Uh, um, Esau, Esau, listen, I don't know how long I'm going to live. Take your bow and arrow, go out, kill some venison like I like, make it like I like, you know that I like it, come in and I'll eat it and I'll bless you. But he didn't say it soft enough because Rebecca heard. And so Esau goes out. And Rebecca says, quick, Jake, come here, hurry, quick, come here. Jake, quick, you go out and you get two kids and you bring them back and I'll make the food like your daddy loves and you go in and you get the blessing. Mom, 
You know, I'm smooth-skinned. And you know what Esau. Well, we can fix that. I'll get his clothes, and I'll put them on, and I'll get the sheepskin, and we'll put him on, and everything will be all right. You, you do the stuff. Notice what it says in um, Genesis uh, 27, 12. Jacob says, perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be a deceiver in his sight. <laughs> what do you think? Hello? I will seem to be a deceiver? Yeah. You will just be at flat out lying to dad right into his sightless face. Yes? Let the curse be on me. And it was, wasn't it? She never saw him again after he left. And so she put the clothes on and so on. And um, so he goes in. Hello, Father. Yes, who are you, my son? Yeah, I'm, I'm an Esau. Verse right to your firstborn. Of John Chester, you told me, arise and do this and bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? And notice his response. He said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. And you know what I see? I see in heaven, I see, and I don't want to get too sacrilegious here, but I see our Heavenly Father raising His eyebrows and looking over at Jesus the Son and saying, Did you hear what He just said? They're implicating us in all of this charade. It's amazing what, cor- what uh, links you go to whenever you started on a wrong course. Well, and so, Jake gets the blessing. Says this in verse 27, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate that. Out the back door. Just in the nick of time because Esau is coming in the front door. Hey, Dad, man, you wouldn't, I, I, I killed this wonderful, wonderful doe. And you know, I've, I've, I've made it just like you like it. Who, who are you? Oh, of course, I'm Esau, your son. Who was that? Your brother has stolen the birthright. Stolen the blessing. And so, you know the story, Esau weeps and he cries, don't you, do you only have one blessing, Dad? Do you have a blessing for me too? Well, yeah, he did. And so Esau said, you know what, Dad's going to die pretty soon. And whenever the days of mourning are over, I'm going to kill my brother. Uh, There again, Rebecca got wind of that too and she says Jake listen um, you know Jake uh, I don't want you to take a, uh, a wife from the, these Canaanites here well, I think let's do this let's send you back to our uh, you know where we used to live back to to your uncle uh, so that you can have a wife actually it was to prevent a murder but it was it was a good thing anyway it turned out to be a good thing and so Jake <clears throat> is on the run right how is Jake feeling Scared? What else? Guilty? Empty? Nervous? Rejected? How alone is Jake feeling? Completely alone. He's alienated dad. His mom and dad have done this. He's certainly alienated his brother. He's alienated God. I mean, he's out there. With, with a blessing on the one hand, with a load of guilt on his shoulders and in his heart on the other hand. Now I have a question for you. If you had just conspired with your mama to deceive your daddy and to steal a blessing from your brother and implicated God in the process, would you ex- be expecting any Direct communication from God anytime soon. No, you would not. Guess what? Guess what? Second night out on the road. 
Jacob, in his aloneness and his weariness and his desperation, prays to God, lays down and goes to sleep. And guess guess what God does, ladies and gentlemen? He gives that rascal a vision. He gives him a vision. A ladder. And he can see all the way up the top of that ladder is God. And God doesn't say from the top of the ladder, Jacob, you rat! I'm going to get you! You better watch out because there's lots of lions out there, you know. And there's lots of robbers out there. You better be careful because you're going to get it. Nothing of that. Notice what God says. Forgive me. Lunch will taste a lot better at 12.30 than at 12. Forgive me. This is what... This is what God says. Um, I am the Lord God of Abraham. This is 28, 13. The angels are ascending and descending upon the ladder. And the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, the north and the south in you. And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you. What? With this rat? I am with you. Listen, brothers and sisters. If you are a believer in Jesus, you may be some kind of a rat today. But God says, I am with you. That kind of blew away my nice, neat theology about God. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, God knows what we deserve, doesn't He? He didn't send Jesus down here to give us what we deserve. He sent Jesus to give us what we need. I am with you and keep you wherever you go. And will bring back to this left, bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Wow. Is that amazing? Or is that amazing? You know what? My prayers, the longer I live and the more I study Scripture, the more simple my prayers become. Lord, teach me the lessons in your holy word. By your Spirit. One day about 1800 years later. Jesus came along. And he was talking to Nathaniel. And he said. Don't be surprised about that. Uh, By and by you're going to see angels. Ascending and descending. Upon the Son of Man. What do you do? What's a ladder for? A ladder is to get from here. To there. And that's what Jesus is. To get us from here. To there. And the journey along the way is wonderful. And I think it's a lady's thing generally. When you ask a lady to climb a ladder, she gets the first rung is okay. Second rung, she gets nervous. Third rung, she's clinging like mad and the ladder is shaking. And I think for most generally us men, we can climb ladders and whatever. You know, there there are some things that are women things and some things that are man things. Whatever. Think of yourself a thousand miles climbing the ladder on the way up to heaven. You see, you're out, you're out there in outer space, okay? And all around you is blackness. It's emptiness. Actually, it's not because there are lots, I mean, lots of ladders are let down and people are climbing all over the place, right? What do you do? The only thing that you can do Logically and realistically is just cling to the ladder. 
The latter is Jesus. Amen. And by the way, Jake learned that for in reality 20 years later as he's clinging to the one he was just fighting with all night long. So I have a suggestion. Let's cling to the latter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy word and for the lessons that it teaches us. Give us grace to learn them and to apply them. In Christ's name, amen.